everyone, Andreas Antonopoulos here. I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina, getting ready for the Latin America Bitcoin Conference. As part of my visit here, I'm meeting much of the Bitcoin community, but I have a special guest, uh, someone who's been very influential in exploring the other layers of protocols that can be installed on top of Bitcoin, the types of applications that come after currency. So my guest here today is Manuel Arauz, who is the founder and chief developer for Proof of Existence, proofofexistence.com. And Proof of Existence is a notarization service that allows you to digitally sign uh, data and prove their existence. So, Manuel, tell me a bit about how you got involved with Bitcoin. Well, I heard about it in 2010, three months before the crash, okay. the, the first $30 crash, Yes, if I'm correct. At first, I was interested in the technology aspect. Uh, I was studying at the university, uh, there's distributed systems and cryptography course, and I was just learning that the distributed timestamping problem was impossible to solve. <laughs> and the next day, I read about Bitcoin and how they solved it, and they created a, an economic system which is decentralized. So I was really impressed by that. At first, I, I started mining a little bit with my GPU, which at that time was enough mm -hmm. to mine. And after that, I, I started investing some money, some savings. In 2014, I started to get involved in the development aspect. I, I started to read code from other projects, and I decided I, I wanted to try and develop something myself. So mm -hmm. that's, what, that's when I... I created proof of existence. At first, the, the idea for proof of existence came first unlinked to Bitcoin. I, I wanted to make a web service where you could certify a document central, in a centralized way. Um, that meant that people had to trust my servers and my authority to certify the document. But as, as I was reading about Bitcoin every day and suddenly the, the, the connection came, came to me and I said, why don't we certify this document with the blockchain, which requires no trust? Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought that would be difficult, like the technical aspect would be difficult, but it proved really simple. I, I discovered like that the programming aspect for Bitcoin is really, really simple. Yes. And so, I cre in fact, I created the, the, the whole site in less than a week. Mm -hmm. in my spare time and that's that I, I created it as a technical experiment and well it got some good reception at first but over the, the last two weeks uh, someone posted it on Hacker News and it went somewhat viral on Twitter so yes. it's, it's now grown a lot more and many people are, are becoming interested in it so let's, uh, let's just uh, quickly describe what, what proof of existence is. So the problem you're solving is uh, the problem of attestation, digital attestation or digital notarization. So in a traditional sense, if you want to prove that someone uh, has a document like a deed to a house or a stock certificate or has created a new um, idea, for example, like a patent or a copyright, and they want to prove that this idea existed at a specific point in time. Today, the way you do that is you go to a public notary in most countries, uh, and they will basically sign and stamp on that piece of paper and put it in a public register, which is, you know, like a paper version of a blockchain. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's distributed. So if somebody wanted to confirm that, they would have to go back to that notary and get a letter that proves that in the register they had your information. So you solve this by uh, essentially fingerprinting or, or getting a hash of, a, of any document. You can put any data stream in this? Yeah, um, any, any digital file. Any digital file. And you create a, a fingerprint. What, what type of fingerprint is that? How many bits? It's SHA-256. SHA-256. Okay, so you've basically got a 256-bit signature. And then how do you insert that into the blockchain? Um, I, I had read 
like the, I didn't invent the technique myself. I so, had read that other people had embedded data uh-huh. in the blockchain, so I started to research on that. And there's two main methods, or at least at that time, yes. the, the most common methods were one was uh, the data fragment for new mined blocks, which the miners control. So this so, is the coin base that goes into the yeah. first transaction. So that was out of my reach because I'm not a, I was not a big miner at the moment. Uh, so the other method is to embed the data inside a Bitcoin address and send the transaction to that address so that this transaction gets stored in the distributed ledger for Bitcoin, which is a blockchain. And in that way, you, you have a distributed means of storing that data. So the basic idea is you replace the public key associated with the Bitcoin address which, with arbitrary data, which uh, in fact renders the, the, the address useless because... There is no private key yeah, corresponding to it. Exactly. So, okay, so this is what uh, in Bitcoin speak is an unspendable output, so a transaction that uh, you send money to and that money disappears because it cannot be redeemed as an input into another transaction. Yeah, exactly. Or more bluntly speaking, people call this dust because theoretically the purpose of the blockchain is to transfer value, not data. Yeah. Right. So uh, I bristle when I hear that description because to me, Bitcoin is a protocol and currency is just the first application and I'm really excited to see other applications. Uh, You know, the basic problem that you described that Satoshi solves, which is achieving distributed consensus without trusted third party, uh, has so many more applications than currency and there's no reason to bootstrap a new blockchain every time you want to build a new application. It's much easier to have the security of five petahashes of mining behind you. Yeah. So did you get that kind of criticism? Did people tell you what you're doing is a waste of time? It's da- dust that's u- using the blockchain wrong? Yeah, I, s- I still get a lot of emails like saying stop spamming the blockchain, even from the Bitcoin core developers. Uh-huh. Not, not, not personal emails, but... When people discuss the service on the forums, their general reaction, they don't seem to like it. We're talking about a tiny amount of data here, right? So SHA-256 is, what, 40 bytes of data? Yeah. And so... No, it's 32, I think. 32. So it's a tiny amount of data. So you're basically using up... Two addresses. Two addresses, two outputs. Do you do that in a single transaction or two transactions? Single transaction. Single transaction, one input, two outputs. Yes. And you actually spend some Bitcoin doing this. Yeah. What's the minimum amount you spend for one of these? I'm not sure because I changed it, but I think it's uh, a Satoshi, or, or just above the dust threshold. Oh, 5,432 5, Satoshis, yes. right, yeah, or something like that, I'm yeah. guessing the number. Right, so, so it's a, it uses a small amount of Bitcoin, this Bitcoin is forever lost, and, and yes. certainly that's an argument for not doing it exactly this way. Now, you, you mentioned to me recently that there are better ways of doing it now. Yeah. So do you want to talk a bit about those? Uh, yeah. Many people have suggested better ways to store data in the blockchain. Using this method, the clients, they can prune these transactions because they don't need to store these outputs in the UTXO, which is the unspent transaction outputs, which is a pretty scarce resource for the network. When uh, transactions are put into the blockchain, each transaction creates an output that in the future could potentially be used as an input in a future transaction. It can be spent. And so each client, in order to be able to figure out what can be spent to create transactions, has to keep a database in memory, usually, of all of the outputs that are in the blockchain currently that have not yet been spent. That includes all of the money that Satoshi mines, uh, a ton of dust from various other services that create unspendable outputs. So the key issue here is not whether it's unspendable, but whether it's provably unspendable. Because if you, if you don't know if it's unspendable, you have to keep it around forever. But if you can prove that it's unspendable, then you can just discard it. The only purpose of it is for archival purposes, right? So it can stay yeah. in the blockchain. So op return is an operand inside the transaction scripting language. So for our audience, uh, within each transaction, even the simple transfer of value for, say, Alice pays Bob for a cup of coffee is actually a a tiny script in a fourth-like language that is evaluated by a state machine. 
and that allows the Satoshi client and all Bitcoin clients to be very flexible in the types of transactions they can process. And up to now, you, with your solution and on all the other solutions for embedding data, you were you, you had to kind of abuse that system. You had to use it yes. in a way that it wasn't intended. But with op return, you can simply say this is a data value that has no spendable use. So you can then prune it. Is that correct? Yeah. So this is a major development. Essentially, op return, which was a very deliberate move, I think, to to create this capability. This makes it possible for all kinds of other protocols to be embedded on top. Uh, I've I've uh, described it as similar to port 80, where you can then shove a ton of other protocols through it, like with HTTP. Would, would you agree? Can you see possibilities for future protocols? Yeah. In fact, there's quite a few projects already working on adding a new protocol layer over Bitcoin. For example, the Mastercoin project is... I, I've actually contributed some code in that project in, in this first month, and we had the same problem. Uh, wanting to embed data in the blockchain and some people didn't like it so this was one of the reactions from the development team okay people are going to use the blockchain for other uses other than a monetary system so let's support that from the protocol in a way that it doesn't hurt the monetary system a more efficient way of doing it yeah now this still creates uh, a bigger blockchain but yeah. That wasn't the main problem, because the blockchain isn't growing very fast when you're adding 32 bytes. The problem was the memory footprint yes. of the UTXO, because you can never get rid of that. You can never summarize it. You can never prove it. So uh, with proof of existence, um, the, the main use is obviously to, to prove a piece of data existed at a specific piece of time. I know I've used it for the Safe Paper Wallet project, and one of the main uses for me was to do code signing so that people could verify that the code they were downloading from Safe Paper Wallet uh, was secure and was the exact same code I had uploaded because the big danger is that a, a hacker could come in, replace it with uh, a code that has, for example, a compromised random number generator and suddenly their paper wallets are no longer secure. Now, traditionally, websites would do this by having the downloadable file and the MD5 or SHA on the same page. And that doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is because if you're a hacker and you have to replace the file, you can replace the shot too. Um, I know some people had previously suggested, oh, let's go back and Google Cache or a Wayback Machine and confirm it was like that before. But with this, you've got five petahashes of mining power guaranteeing it. So for code signing, proof of existence is absolutely amazing. I can think of a couple of other immediate applications, patents being one of them, uh, trademark applications for proof of use. Um, and and perhaps copyright if you're writing something that you want to uh, to prove existence. But uh, I can imagine there are a lot of others. What what strange applications or interesting applications have you seen of your service? Well, um, I was contacted this week actually by an Australian guy who told me he he had uploaded his whole genome, his DNA. Used, wow. Okay. Not not uploaded. Sorry. He, yeah, he, he uploaded the hash to the blockchain. So essentially he proved he himself existed at a certain time in a fully anonymous and distributed way. That is fascinating. So DNA fragment, fingerprinted, and then embedded in the blockchain, proving that this person existed at this particular uh, moment in time. That, that is truly an incredible application and certainly not one that Satoshi would have imagined uh, necessarily, although it is exactly the kind of thing that a distributed ledger of, of asset tracking with consensus validation is, is perfect for. Yeah. I, I have no idea how he would use this or what value it would have, but, uh, but it's definitely very interesting. Yeah. Uh, what other applications have you seen? Anything else like that? Yeah, there's also the idea to certify communications between parties which are involved in a, any sort of agreement. Uh -huh. So you can prove that the other party didn't answer because if you both agree that you're going to upload any communication and certify it with the blockchain, and then you can prove that certain communication stopped at a given time, a given moment in time. So you can do it like registered mail, perhaps, or service of process, where yeah. you want to serve legal papers to someone and prove that you sent it by exactly. it through the blockchain. That is fascinating. 
Um, these are all examples of the basic science that Satoshi solves, which uh, for, for lay people, the idea is that if you have two parties trying to communicate across an insecure medium or two or more parties, um, them being able to achieve consensus when other people can intercept, delete, or uh, corrupt their messages. That, that problem is called the Byzantine General's problem. It's a problem that was first described in 1975, I believe, uh, by a distributed computing scientist. And uh, when Satoshi first published his paper, the immediate response was, well, that could never work, because that would be a solution to the Byzantine General's problem. Turns out it's working. Right? <laughs> we don't know if it's the perfect solution, but it is certainly a, an optimal, optimized solution uh, and seems to be working. So uh, thank you very much uh, both for um, talking to us but also uh, for developing the kinds of applications that really show the future of Bitcoin, the protocol, um, above and beyond uh, Bitcoin, the currency. And I, I hope to hear more during this uh, conference. So uh, Manuel Arauz, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you, Andres. It was really nice to meet you in person. Thank you. EasyDNS is the Swiss army knife for your domain names, helping meet their customers' individual needs since 1998. EasyDNS has been an outspoken critic of SOPA and CISPA. EasyDNS was an early supporter of Bitcoin, and now they are proud to sponsor this show. Do business with a company that shares your values. Get a 13% discount when you pay with Bitcoin. Go to bitcoin.easydns.com and be sure to use discount code LTB.